Hi, welcome back and in this video I want to look at um, what is for me a very special camera. So we're looking at a 35mm film camera here, uh, one that I have owned previously and have rebought, and it is the Canon FTB QL. Um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the camera itself first of all, give you a quick guide to it, and then also talk through the pros and the cons. And I will warn you in advance, the cons list is going to be very small. Make no bones about this up front, I absolutely love this camera and I think it's a bit of a bargain. Um, and I'll explain why as we go through. So starting off with the camera itself, what we've effectively got with the FTB um, is a body that came out in two versions. So it was launched in 1971 um, and then had a minor refresh um, around about 1973, I believe. This particular body was made in 1976. Canada Wonderful and do actually put marking codes inside a lot of their cameras which allow you to age them. So 1976 this one was made, which actually makes it one of the last FTB QLs made. Now the primary difference between the two models, um, externally um, they put a plastic tip on the wind-on lever that you can see there. They also changed the pattern on the shutter speed uh, ring there and they put a plastic cover over the PC sync and added in a depth of field preview lever from the Canon F1. I actually prefer the look of the older lever which had a bit more of an upright presence to it and was slightly larger and easier to find with your finger but it's much of a muchness being perfectly honest. There were some changes under the skin um, in all honesty they did change some of the metal components within the camera for plastic ones but um, it was a high quality plastic they used and arguably the internals on this are slightly less robust than the original versions but they still have a fantastic reputation for reliability. Oh, and one other thing, they put the shutter speed um, readout in the uh, viewfinder on these, you, so you know what shutter speed you set at. You didn't have that on the first generation one. Uh, now, this camera often gets compared to things like, uh, in particular, the Minolta SRT101, and I've got up there um, an SRT 101. One of the important things to be aware about is the difference internally between the two cameras because spec wise they look very similar um, but there's a lot of waxed cord um, and string and things like that used to get the mechanicals working in the SRT 101. Don't get me wrong it's a great camera but in here it's gears, levers, um, ball trains and things like that. These are a much more robust camera, they genuinely are. Um, there's a few other key differences that I'll talk about as we go through, particularly when we get on to the pros. In terms of use, what we've got here is a purely mechanical camera. Um, so although it does have a battery, the battery purely drives the light meter um, and you can take the battery out and the camera will work perfectly well without the battery in it. Um, you've got bulb, um, ooh, accidentally hit the shutter button there, bulb then one second through to one one thousandth of a second with the flash synth being, being at one sixtieth. So fairly common for a camera of its era. Um, so fairly rugged, um, extremely well constructed. Um, it's It's got a decent bit of heft to it and I'll come on and talk about that as we go through. Now what you've also got on here um, with regard to the battery and the metering system is these originally took mercury batteries, 65 mercury batteries, which you cannot, for good reason, get anymore. Now you can use these zinc air batteries or you can use alkaline batteries in these. Zinc airs have a very short life but match the voltage. Um, alkalines are a slightly higher voltage but last a hell of a lot longer. Um, in all honesty, 
while in theory the higher voltage could lead to some metering issues with these, I've not found that to be the case. Um, and looking around the web, certainly pretty much everybody has no issues with the accuracy of the metering, whether you're using zinc air or alkaline batteries in them. One of the other key features behind this camera um, is down to the QL. Now the original FT um, I think was one of the first cameras to have this but this is this little metal plate that you can see here that helps you load the film. So you just pop the film canister in there close that down, pull the leader across, rest it over the sprocket holes there and as you close the back this plate traps it and you can then just fire off a couple of shots and wind on and you're done. Um, unlike the supposed easy or quick load system in the Practicas, and I've talked about that in my MTL um, review, I'll post a link to that up there if you want to have a look at that, the quick load system in here works really well um, and is actually does make loading a film a hell of a lot quicker and easier. Uh, oddly, past the FTB, it never survived. Um, I would imagine it was too expensive because there's a lot of engineering and metal work going on in there, um, and it was dropped for the um, A series cameras and beyond. So it's a shame. I actually quite liked it as a system. So that's a very broad overview of the camera itself, but I want to talk about um, its pros and cons next. Okay, so starting with our first pro, and that is the metering system in the camera. Now, it's a bit unusual to talk about a purely mechanical camera, and the first pro is to talk about its metering system, but it's well deserved when it comes to the FTB. So, it runs a partial metering system in that it's got a slightly etched rectangular area in the center of the viewfinder that it meters off. It's approximately 12% of the actual viewfinder area. So it's it's not center weighted, it is purely metering off of this 12%. So it's kind of a big rectangular spot metering zone. Um, and so long as you're aware of this, this does actually work extremely well. So it allows you to meter for a very set area of the um, of what you're looking at and what you're taking a photograph of. So that's the first thing that's genuinely quite useful about the metering system. But be aware, you do need to know that that's what it's metering from, because if you don't, it can cause you some problems, particularly if you're more used to more modern metering systems like matrix meterings or even center weighted metering. This works very differently, but once you're aware of it and you get used to it, it's incredibly accurate and very useful. The other thing that's really nice about the metering system on this is actually how it reads, and it's very, very clever. So this is a what's known as a match needle display. So with a match needle display, you've effectively got two needles in the viewfinder, on the right-hand side in this case, two needles in there. Normally, one has a circle on the end of it and the other is a straight needle. And basically, to match the metering, you match the two of them up. Now, on cameras like um, the Minolta SRT, one of the needles is basically controlled by the meter, and that moves independently of anything you do, and that's normally the straight needle, and then the one with the circle in it, that moves up and down based on a combination of your aperture and your shutter speed. The problem with that is it has to cram every possible combination into the sweep, which means you lose some of the granular detail. Where the FTB's match needle system comes in and is very clever, um, and in my opinion, easily one of the best match needle systems around, is your needle with the circle on the end of it is linked to the aperture. 
that the camera lens is set to. And the straight needle is linked to the shutter speed and whatever shutter speed you've got set. And you then just match the two up and that's controlled by the light meter where they match up to give you an accurate metering. But it goes further than that because the sweep from the top to the bottom of the needle with the circle on it that's controlled by the aperture is actually linked to the lens you put on it. So if you put on something like we've got here, which is a 50mm f1.8, that sweep will be f1.8 down to f22. But if you put on, say I've got a zoom lens up there, a um, 70 to 150, um, if you put that on there, that's got an aperture range on it of f3.5 to 22. Well, now the entire sweep will be that f3.5 to f22. So the actual sweep is controlled by the lens that you've got on it and the aperture range. Obviously the straight needle for the shutter speed, well, that never varies, you've got that on there. But it also biases that sweep range by whatever the current EV value that's being metered through that 12% rectangular area. What this basically gives you is a very, very granular and fine approach to what you're seeing on the meter, which makes the metering really, really accurate and really easy to use. It also allows you to use it as a, even though it's purely mechanical manual only, to use it as a kind of aperture and shutter priority. It's not true aperture or shutter priority, but you know, basically you can, if you want, set a shutter speed, look through the viewfinder, adjust the aperture and bang, where they meet up, fire away. So that's the aperture set for your chosen shutter speed. And vice versa for aperture priority. Set the aperture you want, adjust the shutter speed, when they match, bang, that is the shutter speed for the aperture you want. So it's not true aperture and shutter priority, but if you're following what I'm saying, it does work quite well at giving you that kind of faux approach to it. Um, so yeah, the metering's really intuitive, really easy to use, really accurate, and is intelligent enough for a camera this old to actually control the range that you're operating across based on the lens and the scene you're metering. That's really quite smart, and that is a definite pro to this camera, without a shadow of a doubt. Okay, moving on to the second pro, and I've already covered this in the intro, and that is the build of it. Honestly, it, it is a beast. Now, some people may be put off with it because in its standard form here, we are looking at about 750 grams, um, so roughly one and a half pounds of weight. It is a hefty camera, but the all metal construction, the way it's put together, the strength of the mechanicals inside it are basically what that weight is giving you. It's what you're getting for that heft. Um, and it's reassuring in the hand to use. It, it is just incredibly well put together. It, it feels so nice to use it really does everything from the, the shutter to the wind on um, just it works so well so it, it's a quick one this but yeah in terms of how well it's constructed how well it's put together um, and how it operates it's a definite plus it's a really reassuring piece of care and when you consider the age of this you know, the 1970s, 1976 in the case of this particular camera, you know, that's, that's 40 plus years old and it still operates absolutely perfectly. That is an incredible achievement and just really nicely put together. So that for me, it, it has to be a pro how well this thing's built, it definitely does. Right, pro number three, it's kind of linked to the last one, and it's why this thing is arguably built so heftily. This was kind of one of Canon's early prosumer models, um, or semi-pro models. So what you've got to a large degree here with the FTB is 
around about 80-90% of a Canon F1. Now the Canon F1 at the same time was Canon's pro model. I've owned one in the past, I unfortunately haven't managed to repurchase one yet because they're not cheap. Um, but this camera is incredibly close to it. What it effectively loses in comparison to an F1, uh, the F1 has interchangeable prisms, so you can change the prisms around on there. It has interchangeable focusing screens, so you can change the focusing screens around in there. And it has the ability to take a motor drive none of which you will find on the FTB. Now for me, they are not massive losses. Um, okay, in particular, the interchangeable prisms and the motor drive in this day and age, uh, I, I can live without those quite, quite comfortably. Um, being able to change the focusing screens, I'll come on to that in the cons, because I, I would like that, being perfectly honest with you. But And the other thing is, if I just pop the back open, um, you may be able to see it there, but this runs a cloth shutter. So it's rubberized silk for the shutter, whereas the um, F1 has a metal shutter, all titanium metal shutter. So you are losing something in the robustness of the shutter itself. But when you can see that you can pick these up for around about £150 and that's easily half the price of a similar aged and similar condition F1. You are getting, as I say, 80-90% of that camera for half the price at least. So that's a definite plus point there. You are getting a hell of a camera that is, you know, 80% a pro camera for not pro camera money. On to our fourth pro, and this this is kind of not often talked about when people talk about the FTB. Um, but with the FTB, Canon introduced what they called their SMS system. Okay, so that is, I just need to check. Shockless mirror system. So the shockless mirror system was kind of a 1970s vibration control. Now, for those of you that have fired um, SLRs, and I include digital SLRs in this, as well as older mechanical ones like this, you'll know full well that when you fire the shutter, that mirror traveling across and the, sorry, that shutter traveling across and the mirror flipping up and back down, that actually can send quite a bit of vibration through a camera. It's noisy and sometimes you can actually, particularly at higher shutter speeds where everything's traveling that much quicker, you can actually feel the camera vibrate or move. And that that's, you know, it's the vibration and the mirror slap from it. And sometimes that can actually cause vibrations, particularly at slower shutter speeds. So what Canon did with the FTB was, as I say, they introduced this SMS system, this shockless mirror system. And what it basically means is when you fire the shutter, you feel, you can hear it, you can definitely hear it, it's not quiet. And this is really hard to get across on a video, but trust me on this, when I depress the shutter here, I feel absolutely nothing from the mirror box here. You cannot feel any vibration from that shutter traveling and you definitely can't feel anything from the mirror slapping up and down. It genuinely is a kind of vibration reduction system from the 70s. Um, and yeah, it's... <laughs> Again, I don't know how much the engineering and the build to put this in here cost, but it is something that still to this day, not enough um, SLRs, be they digital or film cameras that followed this, do, do well enough. Genuinely, this thing is a joy to shoot because of it. It really is. You can operate at genuinely slower shutter speeds without having to worry about one of the factors involved in keeping the camera steady and often the factor that, the, that you have no control over and that is the mirror box of the camera so without a shadow of a doubt 
a real pro um, to the FTB. They genuinely over-engineered this thing for its day and age. They absolutely did. Okay, my fifth and final pro is, well, it's not so much the camera itself, but this bit of it, the lens mount. So it will take the um, FTB series of lenses. It will also, not FTB. <laughs> It will take the Canon FD series of lenses, but it will also operate with the Canon FL series of lenses. You do need to operate those in um, stop-down. So that's the stop-down lever there, and it's got a really nice locking mechanism. So that's your depth of field preview. Just realised you might not be able to see that, so let's get in a bit closer. That's your depth of field preview, and you can see the lens stopping down when I do that there. But you can then just by moving that lever down the bottom, lock that in place. And that's what you need to do to meet up with the FL lenses. You can also take that one step further and some um, FL lenses and maybe some FD lenses need this as well, which is you can then lock the mirror up. Now that's also extremely useful for long exposures. So what you've now got with the mirror locked up, if you were using a long exposure on a tripod, you've absolutely minimizing the vibrations from this camera and it just works really well and to switch that all off you just push the lever at the bottom again and bingo there you go but that's a slight aside because what i actually want to talk about is as i say the lens system that this camera opens up to you basically the fd lens mount and FL, but I'm mainly focusing on the FD lens mount here, produced some absolutely stunning lenses. It really did. There's a fabulous collection of lenses. Even a lot of the more basic kit lenses, like this FD 50mm 1.8 here, are superb performers. They really, really are. And they were mechanically incredibly well made. I mean, this is the cheapest kit lens that the FD series had, being perfectly honest. It, you know, it was slapped on absolutely everything. And the aperture ring on this still has half stops for every single aperture across the range. And that's common across the entire FD range. The glass in these are, are absolutely stunning. I mean, I sold all of my original FD stuff I had years ago, and I seriously regret doing it, being perfectly honest. Um, I had a 50mm f1.4 that I absolutely adored, but my favourite, I had an 85mm f1.8, and Oh, that thing was absolutely superb. It genuinely was. And these are lenses I'm still looking out for. And when I can afford them, I will pick them up um, because they are genuinely good. And then you've got the L series glass for the FD mount. And these are just stunning. So by going with an FTB, you are opening yourself up to a superb range of lenses, which because Canon with their auto move to autofocus and the EOS and into the digital moved to the EF lens mount, these can actually be picked up at some quite reasonable prices. Now, not as cheap as they could um, a few years ago because mirrorless cameras um, mount them very easily. So there's been a bit of a price bump of people put them on adapters and run them on mirrorless bodies, but they're still relatively cheap because none of the current generation of either mirrorless Canon cameras or DSLR cameras from Canon will take them. Hell, even the later film ones, the autofocus film ones couldn't take them either. So as a result, Lenses are freely available, and there's some real crackers in there. You have to struggle to find a bad FD lens. So having access to that lens mount system really is a plus in that regard. Okay, on to the cons behind this camera. Now, I may be hideously biased, in regard to this, and I am only talking for myself, but personally, I've only really got one. Genuinely, I love this little beastie so much, I only have one con in terms of this, and that is, and this was quite common of the era, so it's a marginal call, but 
while the focusing screen for this is absolutely great, it's really bright, it really is bright, the ground glass on it is stunningly bright, it's got a decent eye point, etc, etc. Um, it's got a micro prism collar in the centre, so a micro prism dot in there, and within that dot, that's all you've got to focus. Um, there's no split micro prism in there, which does make focusing a hell of a lot easier. Now, when you're using prime lenses on there, which if you think about it at the time this came out would have been the norm, would have been prime lenses, it's not too bad at all because it's a nice bright viewfinder and you can focus extremely well on it. But as you put zoom lenses on there, they can start to get a bit trickier to focus with, particularly if the light levels drop a little as well. So there is that side to it. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier, I would really have liked this to share um, interchangeable screens with the Canon F1, because then you could have got a split microprism screen from an F1, popped it in here, and bingo, that would have been absolutely brilliant. But we, we can't do that, unfortunately, so we are where we are with the focusing screen on this. That said, it, it's certainly not enough to put me off this camera by any stretch of the imagination, and it's amazing how quickly you do get used to it. And being perfectly honest, you really have to be running lenses that are slower than f5.6 before the microprism starts to black out uh, at all, so it, it's still more than usable. If anything, as the light level drops, that's when you'll tend to suffer from that. So. That really is my personal only con behind this. It, it genuinely is. I, I absolutely love every other factor behind this camera. I think it's a superb piece of kit. Um, it's one I still to this day absolutely love picking up and shooting with. Um, and I'm so glad that I picked one of these up. So, looking at this in summary, um, would I recommend the Canon FTB-QL? Well, in all honesty, if you are looking for a film camera and you want to learn how photography works from a manual approach, at 100%. Um, they're, they're an absolute bargain when you compare them to the prices that a lot of the Canon AE1s, etc., AE1 programs go for. You know, those cameras go for silly money, and being perfectly honest, this is a better camera. I mean, I've, I've used all of those over the years. I've used AE1s, I've used AE1 programs, I've used ALs, ATs, pretty much you name it. Um, I, I love the A1. I've got a Canon A1 up there. I think the A1's a great camera. Do I think in some ways it's as good as this? That's a difficult call, in all honesty. But is this a better camera than the AE1, AE1 programs, etc.? 100%, without a shadow of a doubt, it is. And absurdly, it's cheaper. Absurdly, the A1's cheaper than those as well in a lot of cases. But we'll come back and talk about that another day. But would I recommend this? Absolutely. I mean, if you can live with the weight, and keep in mind you get a big pro which is its build quality and how well it's put together for that weight. Yes, absolutely. It's a stunning piece of kit that produces amazing results. Um, and because they were semi-pro cameras, these tended to be picked up by professionals as a backup to an F1 or uh, were used by serious amateurs, people who looked after them and used them properly and kept them clean and tidy. So a lot of the ones you see around are still in absolutely great condition. Um, and that's a big advantage as well. So yeah, would I recommend the camera with vibration and shake reduction from the 1970s as a 35mm film camera? Uh, 
absolutely a wood in a heartbeat it's it's a great piece of kit and it produces great results so yeah that's my i'm not going to lie ever so slightly biased view of the canon ftb ql second generation in this case um, if you've enjoyed this video please do hit the like button and if you want to see more content like this um, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when new content gets uploaded thanks very much everyone take care